Okay, welcome back. I want to read this vital insight posted on InfoWars yesterday and originally posted on StrikeTheRoot.com. This is an insight which I've been wise to now for almost two years, and it is the absolute best method for bringing down the New World Order peacefully and immediately, which means that it will be, for the most part, ignored and unnoticed by the masses at large. I came to this conclusion just by a process of logic. I started with the formula for government as expounded in the Declaration of Independence that all government springs up from the consent of the governed. Therefore, logically, if your goal is to remove the government from your life, all that needs to be done is to reverse engineer this statement. So let's do that. If you wish to make the government go poof be gone, then you must engineer the mass withdrawal of consent from the population to support and obey that government. It's very simple. I want to read this article to you in its entirety. It's pure manna from heaven, written by Jim Davies, called Time for Civil Disobedience. All right, here it is. Underlying approaches to the great problem of how to rid society of government parasites without violence is the insight of, I know I'm pronouncing this wrong, it's a French name, Entene de la Boutier. I'll uh, uh, put his name down below as a caption so you can see exactly how it's spelled. He is quoted as saying, Resolve to serve no more, and you are at once free. I do not ask that you place hands upon the tyrant to topple him over, but simply that you support him no longer. Then you will behold him like a great colossus whose pedestal has been pulled away, fall of his own weight, and break into pieces. That young Frenchman put his finger right on the great weakness of the governing classes. They absolutely depend on the acquiescence of their victims or support. Take that away, they will implode or fall. No pushing is necessary, no violence from either bullet or ballot. His advice has been round has been around and repeatedly ignored for over four centuries. It is, however, a fundamental premise underlying both the Freedom Academy and the movement for nonviolent resistance in the tradition of Gandhi. What did he mean exactly by resolve to serve no more? Probably both the main senses, the general and the particular. Serving the master in general means obeying his commands or laws, Everyone living in the domain claimed by a government is affected by this sense. If everyone stops obeying, there is nothing he can do about it. He becomes powerless. He may let off a volley of grape shot or spray the crowds with machine gun bullets, but ultimately his goose is cooked. All people having to do, all people have to do is nothing to ignore him. Inducing folk to do nothing is of course slightly less simple. Boy, that's an understatement. The particular sense of serving would be those in literal service to his apparatus of government, government workers. These are crucial. These are the people who wield those machine guns even as the regime is falling. When they serve no more, his reign ends, for government consists of only of people working for it. He can fume and yell and bark as many orders as he wishes, but with no grunts to carry them out, he will be revealed only as the pathetic bu bully he always was. It's a brave thing to do, however, to ignore the law, and it's disruptive to quit government employ. Both actions are life-changing, and the former is very dangerous. De La Boutier was correct, but how does one persuade large numbers of people to take such individual action? For such a resolve is personal. It has to be taken one at a time. In the trenches of World War I, it was sometimes as effective for a whole mass of combatants to rise simultaneously and charge the enemy, but the nature of trenches and ladders meant that they each had to go over the top one by one. Hence, for a moment, they were prime targets for enemy riflemen. It doesn't seem to me a very per practical idea, therefore... To propose to our fellow victims of government to engage in civil disobedience, necessarily one at a time, in a period when government guns and gunners are abundant. Such a strategy would create a lot of martyrs, but not many free people. The math is all wrong. The cell is too tough. 
Both kinds of support must be withdrawn, though. Even if all government employees walked out, and presently no law says they cannot, it would still be necessary for the rest of the population to understand why it should no longer listen to listen for commands and look to government for leadership and goodies. Otherwise, it would be back in business in a heartbeat and by popular demand. Hence, everyone needs to understand why government is a lethal myth. The re-education needs to be universal. Just persuading a minority of leaders will not do. I rather doubt that he had worked out the practical implications of implementing his advice, but De La Bautier was rightly addressing the whole of society and was referring to service in both these senses. The process is underway to re-educate everyone, both those employed by government and the rest of us. As understanding is gained, all decide to leave its employ or not to accept it if offered. Then, as the number of government employees reduces, the risks inherent in civil disobedience recede for everyone else. This is the key, as I see it, to the proper and timely use of civil disobedience. Try this out on a couple of numbers. Suppose there are 10,000 today who feel inclined to flout government's laws, but that there are 800,000 enforcers, various kinds of police nationwide, ready to pounce when they see us doing it. That would be an 80 to 1 advantage in their favor and fatal for us. But take the stage when just 10% of the population has learned what freedom and government are really all about. Then there might be 720,000 enforcers, but 10% of 300 million equals 30 million civilians, as they ar arrogantly call us, ready to wave a mi middle finger at them. The advantage has dramatically shifted to 42 to 1 in our favor. Yet that's the stage when 90% of the task still needs to be completed. At that stage, civil disobedience, forgetting to pay taxes, not bothering to renew licenses or register for drafts, driving at sensible speeds, using drugs of choice, carrying guns without permits, declining to accept legal tender money, actually committing free enterprise, etc., will be both safe will be 3,300 times less dangerous to flout the laws and a major assist in the process of getting the remaining 90% into the freedom schools by demonstrating that government is weak as well as repugnant. It will markedly accelerate the process at just the right time to encourage the latecomers as well as the pioneers or early adopters to take part. To practice civil disobedience today is just premature, but at that time it will become a turbocharger. Take a closer look at the numbers. The Freedom Academy's growth page shows how, on simple and credible assumptions, the set of people ready and eager to practice freedom and not to work for government will double annually. Currently, we are so few to be far below noise level, but around a decade from now, one person in 64 will be in that category. Still few will notice, but then a year later, they will number in 1 in 32, and soon after that, government human resource managers across the land will observe that the normal staff attrition rate has risen by an unexpected 2 or 3 percent. Then we shall then we shall be noticed. A year on, and we'll be 1 in 16, and folk will begin seriously to float laws. The tipping point will happen a year on from then, when we number 1 in 8, for at that time, government will have a hard time impaneling juries who will reliably convict victim, victimless criminals since there must be fewer than 1 in 12 for that to continue. So see the turbocharge effect? Victimless law breaking will then be seen as almost risk free so it will blossom like flowers in the spring. That will be the glorious heyday of civil disobedience lasting three or four years and government will never recover. 1 in 4 and there will be a major collapse of all its alleged services, causing corresponding growth of the white market. One and two, and even the police, who will be the last to quit, will tell the boss to take their jobs and shove them. Finally, the disastrous 10 millennia age of government will be over, first in America, and then everywhere else, and the human race will begin a dramatic new phase of peace and prosperity. Will there be civil disobedience after that historic transition? In one sense, yes. For freedom consists in ignoring orders, but in another sense, no, for disobedience presumes that orders are being given, which are capable of being disobeyed. 
and that will no longer be the case. Okay, I have some great ideas about how to start withdrawing consent. These all revolve around deliberately beginning the process of creating a parallel economy, one which has absolutely no oversight at all from the government and does not use their phony money system. I'll first discuss the best candidate I can see for what would be a great commodity to use as a barter currency. That's going to be my next video, so stay tuned. And visit my latest video on the zombie virus situation for the link farm I started on my first zombie video. There you will find a link to a Google map that pinpoints all the recent incidents with links to all the news related on the problem to date. It's very eye-opening. Well, that's all I've got for now. The next video in this civil disobedience series will be up very soon, so watch for it out here.